I was a functioning alcoholic and I was proud of it. And no one knew. And I just was wanting to feel loved and accepted and to be cool because I was that girl on Dancing with the Stars that could get anybody in a club. You are the person of your life. Like you choose how you want to do it. And I think we get so consumed with what we think people want that we don't know what we want. Welcome to the show, Cheryl. Thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh my God, Anna, I'm so excited to be here. Your story is incredible. So I actually want to start a quote of, start with a quote of yours okay. that really hit me. With a constant feeling of being judged, there were all these voices in my head that would try to take over me. So I would use alcohol to quiet my thoughts. Mm -hmm. So many people yeah. use substances, yeah. addiction, certain things that numb the thoughts because we can get so caught up in our own head. Yeah. And you turning to alcohol was a way to quiet that. Mm -hmm. And you even said that you called yourself a pro professional number. Absolutely, still am. So talk to me about being a professional number, um, how that mm -hmm. feels, and then I really want to dig deep of where it started and your journey today and how you're actually coming out of that. I never understood that, right? So I never understood what I was doing. I thought I was just trying to have fun. Like I thought I was like a girl who lived like an Olympian before I moved here to do Dancing with the Stars. And it was like, when I came here, I always said, it's like a get out of jail free card. Like I, I had the freedom, you know, to do whatever I wanted. We, you know, we don't get checked on the show, like as far as like alcohol or like we don't, it's not like the Olympics in that sense, you know? And so it's like, as long as you show up for work and, and then there was a problem. I finally like had to come to Jesus when it was like, okay, but can I go a day without trying to quiet my thoughts down or to, 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 kind of stopped being on sort of like survival mode, like that fight, flight, or freeze, you know? It was constant like catching that adrenaline, mm -hmm. like wanting it because when I was calm or when I was not creating drama around me, it, there was something wrong. My father was an alcoholic. My mom and dad quickly just, you know, they divorced. My first memory as a kid was seeing my father sleep with, his, with another woman, um, like my very first memory. I got sexually molested when I was a little girl. My mom was just trying to put food on the table. She was never present in that sense, but, you know, all out of good, um, just, just trying to feed us, you know. And then at the same time, I was raised by a nanny from the Philippines who only spoke Tagalog. Then we had a driver who molested me and my... Um, stepsister, my older stepsister, and then that was for me. It was my my normal, my new norm was not normal, right? So I was my mom thought I was deaf as a little girl because of the trauma that has happened, but she wasn't there physically to see it yet. She just thought that oh maybe she's just shy, whatever. I went to a hearing specialist. He's like it's PTSD, and then like I think I was just very confused as to what does love mean already, right? Because like I felt abandoned. Um, I didn't understand that my mom was just trying to like, you know, put food on the table and then she was going through her stuff with my dad and then my dad is a, was a womanizer and went from literally being a, a successful attorney to owning strip clubs in Thailand and like, you know, I was around all of this at a very young age. So what equated love for me was a man who um, was abusive. So I went through lots of, like a few relationships, both physically and mentally abusive. Um, but that was a, an addiction already for me because I had no sense of worth um, or love. I didn't know what that was. That was a turnoff. When a man was sweet to me, I was like, that's disgusting. Mm -hmm. So there was a lot of, I knew what I was feeling wasn't right, like, but I didn't understand what loving yourself or any of that meant. I was a in high school. And then, you know, then I switched from ballet to ballroom. And then with ballroom, it's like a little soap opera, that world, in a good way, but also in a toxic way, to be quite honest. And having to, you know, be, be under a certain weight. Um, it's a man's world, the ballroom world. So I, I was never asked my opinion. No one really cared. And I would question my opinion. I didn't even know my favorite color moving here to LA. Like, I just had no sense of um, identity for myself. Like, I'll never forget doing a master interview. Um, it's interviews that we do for the show, as you know, but I could not do an interview without a glass of wine, no matter what. It was like 7 a.m. It didn't matter what time it was. It was like, because then you have to actually um, 
have a come to Jesus and be like, oh, okay. And you have to just take full responsibility, not of the stuff that you couldn't take responsibility. I'm not saying that it was my fault that I got molested. Absolutely not. Like, I know that that was wrong, but there was like this guilt, like, or did he? Then I start to question my own reality. I start to question myself, like, am I making this story up? And then there's a sense of trust not within myself, which I'm still currently working on. Like, cause think about it, like my, I've got trust issues for very good reasons, right? Like, and so that is a big deal for me. It's like, um, but then it's more about building that trust within myself, right? And a hundred percent. So take me then to when you were on GMA mm -hmm. and you have Diane Sawyer, there's like, hey, this drunk person, mm -hmm. you know, um, did that even, because that's what I'm trying to get no. to, what are the red flags? Yeah. And that to me, listening to it from the outside, yeah. seemed like, man, that would have been a, like Huge. freaking Diane Sawyer. I'd be she, like, uh, maybe you should stop drinking, right? When Diane Sawyer calls you out, yeah, yeah kind of, yeah, well, yeah. Like, it would be a slap in the face. And, and in a way, it, was, it didn't matter. It could have been freaking the president. Oh, yeah. I would still continue to do it because of the shame that was being built. Okay, I want to dig deep here, girl. Yeah, let's go. So she says that you just drink more. Yeah. And then it just makes the, the thing. I, I forgot go about it. it. It's like because I couldn't handle the shame and the guilt. Okay, now it's the shame and the guilt, the, the fact that you went on GMA and drank in the first place? Or no, it was like constant seven nights a week. So it was like um, I, could, I had social anxiety, right. which I didn't know until just recently, but I had to drink in order to be in public. And dancing didn't have to be drunk for that, but I was still drinking. It was like in order for me to even think, okay, I look pretty and I, I'm like, okay. I couldn't be in my own skin comfortably mm. and then also want to be, right? Because it was like, I never felt accepted. And I just was wanting to feel loved and accepted and to be cool. Cause I was that girl on Dancing with the Stars that could get anybody in a club. Mm. And I equated that to like love and acceptance, which is really sad. You know, now that I look at it, it was like, that was when I was in a way being exposed like that because of my behavior like dancing with the bars was one of tmz's like headline mm. and it was as funny as i can laugh about it now but it's not funny like that's painful that's so hurtful that i was i've worked so hard for my craft yet i'm associated with an, a bottle of alcohol you know like that sweaty girl dancing around and not remembering what i'm saying i offended so many people um and i also disrespected myself but there was no love there and they're still, still hard to find, you know, like I'm still working, I'm a work in progress forever, yeah. So yeah, going to then the, the it's stacking on each other. And oh, so totally. having that hard, hard upbringing that I can't even possibly imagine, and then drinking through it, and then feeling the shame of drinking, that can be very overwhelming, I'm sure. Absolutely. And so I've heard you talk about your pivot, your big pivotal moment where you just stopped drinking. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind sharing that, and I have a follow up question. Okay. Because I do wonder if people don't have a pivotal moment like you're about to explain. Well, let me, yeah, let me just, sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but it was my father's death that really was that pivotal moment who, um, he was an alcoholic and it was like, that was when for me, I started busting out into hives. Every time I, I'd smell alcohol, it was like a weird thing. And unfortunately, you know, with my dad's death, there was all these unanswered and I will never know, questions on how he died, right? And he died in Thailand, and it's a different system over there. That's another show. But like, I don't think I was able to put it to rest. And it ate me alive, and the alcohol wasn't working. And it was doing the other, it was the other way around to where like, I was never that girl who got flush. I was never that girl who, I, I was a functioning alcoholic, and I was proud of it. And no one knew. It was more like when I was sober, everyone was like, are you okay? Like, you're not very talkative. And I'm like, um, actually I'm sober. And that's another th trigger for me. It was like, oh, maybe I should just be drunk all the time then. Because like, p I am actually functioning and people have no idea. They had no idea. Have you thought about, and actually I've heard you say in one interview, if my dad hadn't have died and I didn't get that rash on my face, you don't know if you would have, <clears throat> you don't know if you would have stopped drinking. Well, also my fiance, you know, my now husband, he checked me for a, for a second there, but then I was like, I convinced myself that I didn't have a problem, right? And unfortunately it was for vanity purposes. Right. Then how did you get into the comparison of, um, and maybe it wasn't comparison, but you know, like body image. I mean, I'm sure being oh. in that space where it's like, there's so many people, women around you. Um, yeah. And you've said that you've had body And I'm curvy images. and like, that's not, 
you know, a lot of these women are very, um, you know, not curvy. <laughs> like they're just like, they're very petite and that's not my body. And I didn't understand what body dysmorphia was. I didn't understand the way I was thinking and the way I was talking about how I wish, I remember I said something like, I wish someone would tell me that I need to eat a burger one day. Mm. And it's like, you were looking for someone else to give you permission? But it was so unhealthy. Like, first of all, if someone said that to me, that's a concern. That's like actually not something you want to strive for. That's not the goal is to look so sick that I wish someone could tell me that I need to eat a piece of pizza. Like knowing that that is not the right, that's not the goal. That's not a healthy way. As long as I'm shaking my ass on TV with those dance yeah. costumes, I can't help the comparison, the, um, these, you know, people on social media, unfortunately, there's some people that I actually had to erase the Instagram app off my phone last season because it's just toxic, you know? That's what I was gonna ask you. So yeah. how do you go from somebody who is still doing the same job, yeah. you're still up there putting, you know, shaking, um, my ass. shaking your booty, yeah. um, which is amazing, by the way, you Thanks. got an amazing booty, let Thank me just you. say, um, <laughs> that you're shaking your ass up there but you're not now using your um, your vice. Yeah, you're mm -hmm. not using your vice to to comfort you. Mm -hmm. So now, what are you doing in order to not make it to not get trapped in the the spiral of body dysmorphia? Because you don't have that thing to kind of be the disruptor. It's literally one day at a time because that's a whole nother disease for me. It's like it mm -hmm. until I can actually. It's all about going back to the core of loving yourself and understanding that you're beautiful, right? Like I could say it all day long, but do I really mean it? Mm. Like when people say, go to the mirror and say, I love you, I could totally do it all day long, but am I really doing it? Mm. So actually I'd love to talk about that because I just think it would be so difficult to tell people, especially when people think of you as being perfect and like, oh my God, you've got the perfect life and blah, blah, blah. And then now you say out loud, I'm an alcoholic. I'm an addict, yeah. I'm alcoholic. an addict. Uh -huh. How did you actually say those words? Okay. Honestly, for the first time I said it was when AJ was my partner on Dancing with the Stars because he was newly sober. So mind you, I never joined a program until just recently, mm -hmm. right? Like, and even now I'm not necessarily active in going every day to an AA you know, program, but I have a sponsor um, that I see weekly and a therapist that I see weekly and a couples therapist that I see weekly. You know, it's just yeah. constant. and. Um, the first time I said it, it was n not fun. But Who was it to? Do you it was to AJ. Really? Yeah, because even when I stopped drinking, it was a promise to myself. I didn't even tell my fiance at the time that I was going to stop drinking. I just wanted to see mm -hmm. because I know that when you announce it, like for me at least, the pressure of it makes me want to drink again. Right. All right. So it's like. If I'm really serious about this, Cheryl, like, can I actually go a day without drinking? Like, let me just do that because there's a self-sabotage in me as well. That's kind of like, if I announce it, I'm going to drink even more and then I'm going to feel shame. And then it's like a freaking hamster wheel that I need to get off and change the pattern and habit. Like I have to do it and I have to do it within myself. And so then I did that and then I went a week without drinking and then I was like, you know what? I'm good. I never craved it. And it was weird because again, it started with the vanity. And then it started with be me being a competitive person at, at, in nature, right? Like that's who I am. And it's like, oh, you can do five days. Can you do five months? Mm. So it was like this unhealthy, again, way of handling the sobriety. But for me, I knew that I was going to have to check into the nearest rehab if I didn't stop. I was known as that girl. You, you need a drink, go to trailer number 12. Like that mm. is not, that's not who I am at my core. Addiction is a disease and everybody will be triggered in certain ways that we will never know. And that doesn't mean it's your fault, right? I do know that. I do know that I'm doing the best that I can at this time, at this moment. I, and that's all I can do. That's all I can do because it's all a lesson. But when I start to blame or when I stop taking responsibility, then I know I'm not on the path to where I want to be. All you can control is you and you cannot change anybody. And it's like you put, I used to put so much effort into trying to change people mm -hmm. that it was like, but then I, how about me? Like, oh, that's all you can do. And it's just like, it's one hour at a time for me. It's like, okay, like, what did I do today? Did I give myself 15 minutes to meditate? Did I? write in my five minute journal? Did I express gratitude? Like just little freaking things 
And then I, I am very proud of myself for that. Like I actually, that creates me loving myself and respecting myself more when I have, just take those 10, 15 minutes. But when I let work consume my life and then I totally dismiss all of that, mm. then I, know, I notice that I don't like myself as much. Is that voice in your head being mean and cruel to you? Is it chipping away at your accomplishments, making you feel less than? Guys, I get it. That voice can be so freaking painful, but it can also be an incredible motivator. And you can learn how to do this and more in my new book, Radical Confidence. This book, guys, will provide you with tactics, tips, and actual concrete, no BS strategies in order to become your most freaking confident self. So talk to me about that then, yeah. because there's, there's a whole Labels. thing of other things over mm. here, right, that you now have to address. It's, it's the addiction of the bad thoughts, right? right. The repetitiveness the of- The abuse you're giving to yourself, right. So have you thought about that? Because I've heard you say like, you're so busy, you don't, um, you keep yourself busy. That's just your addiction. Yes. You're not able to sleep much. So mm -hmm. all of these things seem so much better. But it's still just as bad. Yeah. So how, and maybe that I've just caught you in real time working through that. Yeah. But how are you looking at this new somewhat addiction that you're putting mm -hmm. yourself into and thinking of it? Well, I, I always say like the awareness, right? That that's mm -hmm. a great thing, mm -hmm. that it's baby steps. And I think I have to treat this like when I was abusing alcohol, mm -hmm. like um, this is new for me, right? So I am just putting the pieces together as, see, my mother worked her butt off. So when I was being raised by her, all I saw was her way of never being home, constantly stressed, didn't know that stress makes you stupid. You know, like all this stuff that I just wasn't aware of, that was what a boss babe looked like. And I wanted to be that. And so for me, the stress, like the addiction to stress runs in the family, mm -hmm. right? Like if you're not stressed, you're not being productive. That means what is your purpose in life almost? It's like, why are you, why aren't you putting everything into work? Like my mom grew up in poverty. That, that fortunately wasn't my life, you know, so that for her, she needed to prove herself to, to be able to take care of herself and her kids. For me, it's like still finding my own identity as a sober woman. I thought this is the way I should be, and so therefore I needed to be this person, but what do I really want? Like, who am I? Do I even like to dance? Do I like to be judged? Do I like a number being held up to my face? Do I even, like, why, why do I care about certain things that deep down inside, that's not what life is? Like, I'm just trying to be happy and understand that peace is not boring. Peace is a beautiful thing, but there's only little tiny seconds that maybe once every few months I experience that. And then I have to be intentional and be like, this is a good thing. This is great. Enjoy it, this moment. Oh my God. So when you said, I, that was amazing. You said like, do I still like dancing? Do I like numbers being held up? Cause it's so powerful. And the reason why it's so powerful is we get in habits of things, mm -hmm. this is my life. Well, of course I do this. Well, of mm -hmm. course I do that. Mm -hmm. We don't actually ask if we should still be doing it. Then maybe we wanted it five years ago. Mm -hmm. Maybe we wanted it last year, but is this still what I want in life? Mm -hmm. Yes or no? And go, I got trapped in that for eight years. I was a stay at home wife supporting my husband. And I didn't ask myself, is this the life I want? Right. And then even now, but well, because of that, I now ask myself probably every quarterly, okay. I say, do I still want to be business partners with my husband? Do I still want to be a host? Do I still want to run a company? Mm -hmm. Because I never want to get trapped there. And I love that that's such a, like, it's all about tactics. Yeah, so no, like for that. people at home to right now, mm -hmm. look at their lives and look at what yeah. they're doing and say, um, is this still what I want? Do I still want this? And I think it's hard for people because sometimes it's like, what if the answer's no? But what if they don't know how to answer it? Like, I Ooh. actually want to take it a step yeah, further please. back love because that. like, that took me a long time because there was a loss of identity, right? Because like, oh. if you're just trying to get to know yourself and we evolve, whether you like it or not, we are, the time's ticking and we're just like, we are here and we don't know what's gonna happen tomorrow. You are the person of your life. Like you choose how you want to do it. And I think we get so consumed with what we think people want that we don't know what we want. 
100% asking yourself and finding out who you are because you've even said like I didn't even know what color I liked so no. actually let's go de a little deeper on yeah, that on yeah. how did you and you gave a couple examples which I love is asking yourself the questions yeah so what other things were you doing so like what questions were you asking yourself in order to figure out who Cheryl was in order to then ask yourself do I still want to dance it's my body language, right? So it's like, if I feel a certain thing, so like, you know, when you watch something and you just get chills, you can't make that shit up. Like that is a real, that's authentic. Or you listen to a song and you're like, just waterworks because like, you're not faking that. And it's a feeling that I can't really explain. Mm. And I think it's because of my dance experience that I sometimes think that words get complicated and that body language is just sometimes the way to go. So I'm yeah, creating a dance yeah. program called Body Language. Okay. And it's literally about how, I'm just based off my own experience, I also have a certified therapist who's um, partner now, Katie Morton, and um, she and I have really put together a curriculum where it's like, instead of me saying dance was therapeutic, how was it therapeutic? And like, let's share it with people. Like, my, a family member could have used this, like instead of talk therapy, not everybody can put it into words. Mm -hmm. You can heal through movement. I've seen it happen. I've been a part of it for 25 seasons. I danced with Jack Osborne who had MS. It helped, dance helped. I'm very sensitive to it because I do believe when I was a little girl and I thought, my mom thought I was um, deaf, that that's all I had because that's all I knew. That's my authentic self deep down inside me is, is those feelings that I can't, that are so real that I can't actually quiet down, nor would I want to, right? And so you're taking that and putting it into the small things of your life Absolutely. to figure out who you are. And to figure out like decisions, like big decisions in my life. Like, do I feel hmm. like I have to reassess constantly, like the people I'm with, the people I hang out with. Am I, you are, I truly believe you are who you hang out with. How are you assessing that? Because that's odd, especially if it's friendships that have been around for a long time. I know. Friendship is like something you work on like a marriage, right? Like it's constant evolve. You want to evolve and you want to do it together. You want to have these crazy conversations, but it's when it's like the conversations stop, when you're kind of like, oh, okay, so you're just a chapter and that's okay. And that's okay. You know, it's like you were my party friend, mm. you know, and now we don't have much in common. And that's okay. I mean, like I love that whoever it is and the people forever. Like I think that they played a vital part in my life. But right now I'm going through this, I guess for New Year's, I was like, I need to hang out with people who are smarter than me. I never want to never challenge my brain again in that mm -hmm. sense. It is challenging, but I would like to learn instead of be the one to teach all the time. Wow, so going through that growth then, how are you handling it? Because it's tough when other people, if you've been in that circle of like other people that are mm -hmm. partiers and they do it like you and now you're the one changing. How have you been communicating that to the people if you're distancing or you don't communicate, you just distance? Um, they've distanced. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I think I, I knew it was coming. Like, I accepted it. Okay. Because um, for me, it's like I love these deep, weird conversations and it's like I'd rather have one friend than have a 10,000 of them, but they know where to find me and vice versa. Like. There, I have no hard feelings, but I just, I'm, I also don't want to have empty conversations. That yeah. just doesn't, that's like abusing myself again for some reason. Until I trust myself, I need to always go with that feeling, that intuition. I guess you, if you want to put it into words, that's what it is. So is that the stepping stone that you're working on now, trusting mm. yourself and building your intuition? Mm -hmm. And acting on it. Like if I know that something's not good for me, do I stay or do I go? Do I eliminate it like oh, completely from my life or do I stay? Because there's that little girl inside me that just doesn't want to feel abandoned. And so what do you do when she shows up now when you don't have alcohol? I'm still so mean to her. Like, honestly, I just caught myself. At least I'm just the awareness, right? Mm -hmm. So like, I'm just, it is um, something I'm working on with my therapist at the moment, but it's uncomfortable. I've, she even said in my gratitude journal, when they ask like, um, what like an affirmation, Try and do an affirmation that compliments you physically. And I'm like, uh-uh. Like, I can't say that I oh. am beautiful. And, but that's too general. She wants me to be specific. So it's like, I love my hourglass figure. Or like, like I tend to be self-deprecating, which is just another way to mm -hmm. uh, numb because I'm just making fun of something that's not, you know what I mean? Like, I make a joke because I'm so uncomfortable. That's how I'm feeling when I'm, like, I couldn't even 
pretend just now, right? Because I'm so uncomfortable with like complimenting myself. But first, prior to that, it was like taking a compliment from somebody without bashing it. So like if you were to tell me you're amazing, I'm like, oh yeah, <laughs> you're amazing. Like, no, no, just say thank you. It's so common. Oh my God, thank you for saying that because it is so true. People are like, oh, well, you should have seen me yesterday. I was a mess. Or like, right. or like, oh yeah, someone else did my hair. Or Right. Like I didn't do any of this. Yeah, like you're crediting other people. Yeah, when I started to notice that I actually started to do that, I was like, okay, I understand why I do it. It makes me uncomfortable. Why? why? Because I don't want other people to feel bad. So if someone's complimenting yes, me, yes, yes, yes. I don't want them to Come feel like, or, yeah, like yeah. I don't want to be like, oh, thanks. You know, like, yeah, oh, I look <laughs> beautiful. You know, because we've been trained to go, no, 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 you look beautiful. Beautiful. Right. But I realized I was doing a detriment to myself yes. and the person that's giving me the compliment. Yes, you're not hearing them in a way. And so I made it a point mm. and I just told myself, and this is kind of how, very much like you, I'm a little binary. So I'm just <laughs> like, all right, from this day on, from this day on, when someone compliments me, the words out of my mouth are going to be, thank you so much. That's yeah. really meaningful. And it then silence. And it's okay. And I also made a promise to myself that when I notice people that are close to me mm. do the same, I'm going to call them on it. And I think as women, it is important to help each other. So it's like I call each other, I don't like it. I say the words call them out, yeah. but that doesn't actually feel good. It's right. like I try to show them how maybe the language they are using isn't serving them. And that's my hope is that yeah. I've so done that to myself mm. where I've I um, that dismissed yeah, I myself. That where I've not taken mm. myself into account, where I've joked about all of my inadequacies or all the things that have that I hold shame over, the right. jokes, right, like make it feel better. And that's where I go to, then I go to tactics, okay? I, I know that I can get in my own head, what are the tactics? So that's where I came up with the tactic word, was it is so instinctual in me to be like, oh no, this, oh, this silly thing, oh no, don't worry about this set, oh, I'm not, I'm not really a good host. Like all these things are so instinctual, so freaking ingrained in me that I just go, how do I break it? I oh. can't convince myself, so I put in the rule. The very freaking next time, Lisa, you go to say, when someone gives you a compliment, you go to say anything but thank you, stop yourself. So let's say, for instance, you say, oh my God, this set is amazing. Once upon a time, I was like, oh, well, you know, I didn't, I didn't build it. Right. And, you know, then it was just like, oh, thank you. And now it's thank you. And it actually was really and difficult. And you're taking it in, like in a good way. Like yeah. you're hearing, so like say, you believe and, it. But I give the, not even the caveat, I give the frame, thank you. And it wasn't easy. Thank you. Oh, okay. And it was actually hard and I'm proud of myself. Oh, thank see, you that's and nice. yeah. whatever end you want to follow yeah. up on. But now it's taking you from just saying thank you to then saying something else. Right. To then anything you say, right? Repetition creates habit. Repetition Absolutely. creates habit. That's key, yeah. So all you have to do from step one is just say thank you. Mm -hmm. And so I know that over time mm -hmm. that repetition will become habit. Right. To the point where you see me in real time, today where I am, where the habit now is noticing when other people put themselves down without realizing it. Um, where can people follow yeah. what you're doing okay. and the fact that you're showing all of this in real time, it's so beautiful. Where can people follow you to? Well, I mean, uh, social media, obviously. So Instagram is at Cheryl Burke, um, and same with Twitter, and same with Facebook. And um, stay tuned, I guess, for hopefully a release of my uh, dance program body language. Um, I'm not a therapist, but I only know from experience how movement saved my life. So that's amazing, guys, guys, guys. You really do have to go out and check out check out her YouTube channel. It really is so raw and real. And what I've loved, loved mm -hmm. about this discussion is it's in real time. It's real people, us two sitting here on a couch talking about real shit and things that she's actually going through right now. So go check out her YouTube channel. If you're not following me, guys, follow me at Lisa Billu. And if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button down there. And until next time, as always, be the hero of your own life. Peace out, guys.